Welcome to the now weekly Trust and Atira Zoom lecture series. <clears throat> My name is Marcus Howard of East Horizon Stories, and we're an independent collective of historians on Trust and Atira who refuse to let a virus get in the way of us remembering our great Irish history this year. Um, as a matter of fact, a number of us have said we've probably learned a whole lot more history as, as a result of having these lectures. And we've also partaken in saving some vitally important history sites too. We have also been recommended by RTE and often they have audiences from all over the world. So we're kicking ass, thanks to Liam O'Sullivan, Neve Hassett, Conor O'Dullohan, Mary Ann Mayer, and all the other great hosts and historians. We'd like to thank you for attending them and for spurring us on too. One of the comments this week when we announced we were going weekly was that it was a lifeline for them from current events. So thank you. Uh, next Wednesday, <laughs> we have the Spanish flu of 1918 by Ida Milne, which is going to be very interesting. Um, tonight, though, we are looking at murder by persons unknown in a hotbed of insurgents by an excellent historian and good friend, Sean Collins. On Shrove Tuesday, 1921, two Republicans, Alderman Thomas Halpin and Sean Moran, who's a native of Enniscorty, were taken from their homes in Drogheda, brought to a secluded spot outside the town and brutally murdered. This lecture is going to examine the background and the evidence. Sean Collins, who's our speaker tonight, is a native of Drada, born in Halpin Terrace, graduate of UCD, holds an MA in modern history, also an alumni of Boston College. He regularly broadcasts on history topics. He's published on local history. He's actively engaged with all communities in Northern Ireland long before it was fashionable to do so. We also have an interesting um, guest tonight. We have uh, Desmond Fitzpatrick, who's the nephew of Sean Moran, who resides in Coolock Road, Galway. Desmond's mother was Maya, or Moira, a sister to Sean Moran. Uh, Des lives in Galway and up to recently drove to Enniscorty to facilitate lectures in the museum on the history of the Moran and Fitzpatrick family in Enniscorty, who were active in the East Rising in Enniscorty in 1916. And we'd also like to welcome some of the Halpin family who are here tonight. So this talk is both for the Moran and Halpin family and also to the rest of us who are going to learn more of our Irish history. Over to you, Sean Collins, you're very welcome. Well, thank you indeed, Marcus, for that uh, entertaining welcome. I was beginning to wonder who you were talking about there for a while, but anyway, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm delighted you tuned in. You're very welcome. Uh, we're going to look tonight at the episode in Drogheda uh, on Shrove Tuesday of the 9th of February, 1921. Um, I'm endeavouring in this talk uh, to set the event in a national context. Um, I was born in Halpin Terrace in Drogheda uh, a long time ago, and uh, I was very conscious uh, of the fact that the street I, terrace of houses I was born in were called after Tom Halpin, and across the road was Moran Terrace, which was called after Sean Moran. So from my earliest days, uh, the two names have stuck in my mind. Um, Drogheda is uh, one of the, I suppose, garrison towns of the Pale. Uh, it has a long and ancient history. Uh, it's set in a valley which has a, an amazing uh, heritage interest in the Boyne Valley where megalithic tomb builders just up the road, the Battle of the Boyne site, early Christian settlement, it's all here. But this story, of course, comes from the war of the period we know as the War of Independence. And I'm just getting my, ah yeah, here we go. The monument at the Marsh Road in Drogheda marks the spot where the two men were killed. Uh, the monument says that it's in loving memory of the heroic men, Thomas Halpin and Captain Sean Moran, who were murdered by soldiers of the British Army on the 9th of February, 1921. Now just focus on that notion. They say they were murdered by soldiers of the British Army. That's what the monument says. When you go to Halpin's grave, uh, he's buried with his wife's family, and it says he was shot on Ash Wednesday, 9th of February, 1921. Uh, when we flick over then to Enniscorty, uh, we find that Sean Moran's grave uh, buried in the family plot. And again, it says, uh, who was murdered at Drogheda by British forces. So they're the three memorials uh, where the men are remembered. 
and uh, you can see the different perspectives presented by the notion of the memorial. Uh, to move back and maybe consider the, uh, we we'll say the genealogy of republicanism in Drogheda, uh, this gentleman here, as uh, some of you might uh, recognize him, he's Thomas Clark Luby, uh, a founder member of the Fenian Brotherhood. According to Hughes's history of Drogheda, on a Sunday afternoon in Keepox Hotel in West Street, Drogheda, now the Westcourt Hotel, if you're familiar with that, Thomas Clark Luby inaugurated the Fenian Brotherhood in 1862 and swore in six of the town's citizens. Uh, they all worked actively to propagate the cause through the town and surrounding district, districts. The young and the old came forward to yield allegiance to the Irish Republic, now virtually established. Among the fair sex too, the movement had many sympathizers as they afterwards, to their credit, nobly exemplified. On the 15th of September, 1865, the offices of the Irish people were raided and the names of the Drogheda Fenians were found among them. James Hart, one of the Fenian centers or leaders, uh, settled in the town in the aftermath of their insurrection, although most of his family had to move to America. The Drogheda insurrection failed because the guns and ammunition didn't arrive until after the men had gathered at Bolton Square. In the aftermath, the constabulary arrested everybody they expect, suspected of having Fenian links in the town. Uh, the leaders dispersed, including Hart, but his daughter, uh, men like Patrick Wall, I should point, he, I just spot him here, he's out to give me a surprise. He was one of the local men deported in 1867 for his part in the local Fenian rebellion. He wrote home saying that the thing that surprised them most that when they arrived um, in the prison in Australia, they were presented with Fenian, with prisoner uh, convict uniforms made of Drogheda linen. So uh, Drogheda was obviously exporting uh, linen to Australia at that period. Uh, Hart's daughter, settled in the town even after all the Fenian activities, and she married Hugh Taunton. Uh, Hugh Taunton was a member of the Taunton family who had carried on business in the town uh, from perhaps the early 1800s as painters and decorators. Uh, their son, Frank, later recalled, my people on my mother's side were hearts, and my grandfather, John Hart, and his sons took part in the 67 Fenian Rebellion. My mother always preached Fenianism to us, and my grandfather taught me that very fine old ballad, The Bold Fenian Men. In 1911, due to economic recession in Ireland, the family moved to Liverpool, where they worked for Harland and Wolf shipbuilders. Hugh and his three sons, Frank, Patrick, and Hugh Jr., and a daughter, Nora, they all became involved in the GAA, the Gaelic League, and the Irish Volunteers. At a GAA match in Liverpool in August of 1918, Frank Taunton first met Michael Collins on the day the First World War began. The, the members of the family all returned to Dublin in 1916 to join the Kimmage garrison in preparation for the Rising. Frank Taunton, I'll just get back to Frank for a sec here, yeah. <laughs> in his volunteer uniform here as quite a young man. Uh, Frank Taunton uh, fought in Liberty Hall, Beresford Place, Westmoreland Street, the Telephone Exchange, Crown Alley, the Imperial Hotel, and eventually O'Connell Street, where he was subsequently arrested. Uh, the soldier that, or policeman that arrested him, when he asked him his name, he said he was Pruncheus O'Drynon, which would be Gaelic for Francis Taunton. Uh, obviously, the policeman had a bit of Irish. He wrote down that he knew Pruncheus was Francis. So we entered Taunton as Frank Drennan. And subsequently, Taunton was jailed in England for nearly 11 months under the name of Frank Drennan. And uh, he never told anybody that he wasn't uh, Frank Drennan. <laughs> he was actually Frank Taunton. So if you look in different people's stories about the rise, and particularly the time in prison in England with this fellow Frank Drennan, 
he was actually Frank Taunton. So I think he displayed that he was a man in the shadows, as he would later on become. He also attended St. Joseph's CBS school in Drogheda, where one of his classmates was Tom Halpin. So they were old pals. Uh, this is perhaps one of the best known pictures uh, of the 1916 Rising, one of only two that were taken inside the GPO. The head propped up there in the centre, there are three people each side of him, is Hugh Taunton, uh, a younger brother of Frank. Uh, Hugh Taunton was also part of the Kimmage Garrison and the Irish Volunteers in Liverpool. Sadly, he was killed in action in the Civil War uh, in 1922 as a captain in the National Army. Recalling his rise in experience, Hugh wrote, I was in the GPO area all week, surrendered on the 29th of April, my 19th birthday. I was deported to Stafford Prison and the following night and afterwards sent to Frangoch. Uh, one of the practices uh, by the British authorities at the time was to identify men they had interned who were domiciled in England. And under the Military Services Act, uh, they could conscript them into the army. So Frank was taken from his prison camp at Frangoch under the Military Services Act. He said, I was tried by district court martial for refusing to put on khaki and was sentenced to two years hard labor. I was sent to Carnarvon prison and there four weeks when my sentence was reduced to 12 months detention. I was then sent, supposed to wear khaki to drill in a detention barracks. I refused to put on khaki again. There, are three NCOs stripped me and put it on me. They dressed me in khaki 11 times while I was there, but I took it off always as soon as their backs were torn. I was for 37 days without any clothes, and during the whole time, I only got three hours exercise. I was released from there on the 12th of December, and on the 22nd of December, I was discharged from the army, an army I was never in. So that was Hugh's experience uh, in the Rising. Uh, Nora, the sister, was uh, sent down on Easter Monday uh, to Kerry with dispatches on behalf of Sean McDermott, and she sensibly remained in Kerry for some time after. Uh, Tom Halpin, who was, no, was, I'm afraid I messed up on that slide. Let's see, here we go. There's poor Tom. Uh, Tom Halpin was born in Drogheda. In 1895, his father, John, who was from Westmead, came to work as a master cooper in Preston's whiskey distillery in the town. John married Mary Morphy, a local, and Tom was their second eldest child. Tom was educated at Westgate School and later at the Christian Brothers at Sunday's Gate where Frank Taunton was in the same class. He served as an altar boy in the Augustinian church and later joined the choir. He played Gaelic football with the Stars GFC and hauling with the Drogheda John Mitchells. That's a name that's in trouble at the moment, poor John Mitchell, they want to take his name away. He possessed a fine tenor voice and performed at her Airdrops and Sinn Féin concerts in the town, being particularly noted for his rendition of the Valley of Slievenamon. The local paper said his fame as a tenor had spread to the metropolis. He was an active member with his father of the T.P. Gill branch of the Irish National Foresters. He was first mentioned in the Drogheda Argus on August 14th, 1915, as a member of the AOH. While he joined the volunteers at the start in 1914, he did not parade in Drogheda on Easter Sunday, 1916, but he was arrested in the general roundup after the rising had ended. He was interned in Wandsworth Prison from the 7th of May until the 24th of June, 1916, where he was visited by Belfast nationalist MP Joe Nolan, possibly because of his AOH membership. During this period, he was employed at the Drogheda Chemical Manure. He married Agnes Leach on the 25th of June, 1919, where he did, and at that time he was working as a clerk in Kirkpatrick's timber merchants. Uh, Sean Moran, uh, a native of Enniscorthy, pictured here um, 
on the right hand end of the picture, second face in the background with no hat. Uh, this is the guard of honor at Seamus Rafter's funeral. Uh, more in, or John, Sean or John, whichever you prefer to call him, was born in Enniscorthy in 1887. He was a son of William and Mary Ann. His father was a tailor in the town. He joined the Irish Volunteers at the Foundation and served in the Enniscorthy garrison in 1916. He was arrested and interned in Frangoc in Wales after the 1916 Rising. He married Bridget Cullen from Oilgate in 1919 and in April of the following year, they moved to Drogheda, where John secured employment in cattle printers. Uh, Seamus Rafter, who was a leader among the men in Enniscorthy in 1916, uh, while manufacturing explosives uh, in, in September of 1918, he blew himself up. And this was his funeral guard of honor. And it's one of the first places I could find a picture of more. So you'll, you'll recognize them when you see pictures that coming after this. Uh, I should mention then this, there's Sean in his memorial card. This is District Inspector Carberry, uh, interviewed in the English Field magazine in 1916. District Inspector Carberry described Drada as a hotbed of insurgents. Joseph A. Carberry served as a member of the RAC for 42 years. He was in Drogheda as district inspector from 1905 until 1921. Uh, he lived at Beach, Beach Grove House, where he raised the buying strain of red settles. So if there's any red settle fans out there, uh, they might recognize the strain. He retired to Dunleary in 1921, but was buried in Drogheda when he died in 1940. The Field magazine reported that what District Inspector Carberry suffered in Drogheda cannot be described. He told us personal experience, which are too horrible to hint at. Um, it amazes me because nothing happened in Drogheda in 1916. <laughs> the gathering taking part in the rebellion, it just didn't happen. But uh, poor Carberry obviously had terrible memories. Philip Monaghan, Dublin-born man, came to teach in Drogheda Science at the Christian Brothers School at Sunders Gate. He was elected Commandant of the Irish Volunteers in the town in 1915, when a small group of men got together to establish themselves uh, for a hope for rebellion. Um, the upwards on 100% of the National Volunteers in Drogheda followed Redmond's call. And so when this group came together in 1915, they were very small in number. Uh, but Monaghan uh, was the popular officer and he devoted a life, his life at that period to the cause of the Irish uh, volunteers uh, and became the first Sinn Féin mayor of Drada when he was elected to the council in the local elections of 1920. J.J. O'Kelly, uh, Skellig, known as uh, the uh, journalist Skellig, was elected as the Sinn Féin TD for South Loud in the 1918 general election. Um, James Murphy first came to prominence at this time as the organiser of Sinn Féin in the town for the election. In his MI5 file at the British Archives, James Murphy is described as the most active Sinn Féin man in Drogheda. Uh, he was a native of the town, kept a shop in West Street where he operated a draper's business. Um, he, forced, he was elected to both Loud County Council and Drogheda Corporation in 1920. With the unanimous support of his Sinn Féin colleagues, he became chairman of Loud County Council. He was arrested in Dundalk on the 21st of April 1921 on suspicion of seditious activities, but he was released in August as the Sinn Féin TD to, to attend the Mansion House Peace Conference. While walking on the 1918 general election to support uh, uh, Skellig, J.J. O'Kelly, he was in active correspondence with Frank Taunton, who was then in Belfast prison, 
and Philip Monaghan, who was in Lincoln prison. So I think that's why they described him in his file as the most active Sinn Féin man, because everybody else was in jail. Um, the Stars GFC, a football club established in the town in 1912. Um, this photograph of the team, uh, the very central men are Larry Walsh, uh, Tom Bork, and Tom Halpin is sitting front in front of the other two with his arm in a sling. Uh, the Stars GFC comprised, I think, the whole Sinn Féin Irish volunteer movement that existed in Drogheda at the time. On January the 11th, 1919, the AGM of the Stars GFC was held at the Central Hotel in Drogheda. The chairman, Anthony Wogan, in his opening address, described the club as the nursery of Sinn Féin in Drogheda. Speeches were made by J.J. O'Kelly, TD, Philip Monaghan, who would soon be the mayor, Joe Stanley, uh, the Republican printer, James Murphy, Larry Walsh, Michael Butterley, Joe Carr, Tom Buck, indeed all the leading knights of Sinn Féin, the Irish Volunteers and the GAA in Drogheda were present at that AGM. The 1920 local elections saw Tom Halpin standing as a candidate for Sinn Féin in the Westgate Ward. The Second Military Services Act of 1918 proposed conscription for Ireland. This proposal, more than anything, unified, unified uh, the Irish populace against British rule. The ranks of the Irish volunteers were swelled with new members. Philip Monaghan compiled a list of 250 men in Drogheda, which he sent to Tom Halpin for correction. His cover letter noted that the list was not complete. Uh, remarkably, the list is available in the administration files of the Military Bureau of Intelligence, where it was sent by James Murphy in 1934. And it shows all the men who had signed up and where they lived in Drogheda at the time. So if somebody is researching their um, Republican roots, it would certainly be helpful to them. In Drogheda in the local election of 1920, Sinn Féin fielded 18 candidates in three wards. The media noted volunteer police manned the ballot boxes, wearing armlets inscribed with IV on them. Sinn Féin secured 13 of the 24 seats on Drogheda Corporation, giving them the majority and the securing the merity for the first time. Tom Halpin and Philip Monaghan were their two highest vote getters and Monaghan was subsequently elected mayor. It was reported that Tom Halpin did not make speeches at electoral rallies, but being a fine tenor, he always sang this air, uh, this song to the air of the Mountains of Morn. Well, I'm afraid I'm not a great tenor, but I'm going to struggle through one verse of Tom Halpin's song. Uh, you know, at these political meetings, people get very bored with speeches. So I think it was a very good tactic and uh, so you're just going, if you want to just put your fingers in your ears for a few minutes, I'm going to sing, okay? <laughs> so Tom sang, um, when William of Orange arrived at the Boyne, he drew up his troops in a strong, sturdy line and spoke to them quietly. You've now reached the spot where you must be a jobber or else you'll be shot. For the town corporation is the last word and fraud. A stronghold of jobbery is the town of Drogheda. You could tie all their good works with a hayfoot of twine, where the hillsides of Cullen sweep down to the vine. So we sang six verses, but I'm only going to punish you uh, by singing one. Um, to continue our build up to the story, it's necessary to have a look at this beautiful painting. Um, in the <laughs> immediate aftermath of the 1916 rising, uh, the rebels who were gathered uh, at the Rotunda Hospital were given some very harsh treatment by a, a captain in the army by the name of Lee Wilson. Um, sometime after his death, his wife acquired this Caravaggio, which now hangs and is part of the National Collection. But Lee Wilson, uh, it was said, 
abused uh, the men who had gathered uh, in the, uh, who had been rounded up effectively in the grounds of the rotunda. And in particular, he was noted for having Tom Clark, the old Republican or the old rebel, stripped and humiliated in front of the crowd. Uh, Collins always swore that someday they'd have revenge on Wilson. And they certainly had. Um, Tom, uh, Frank Taunton uh, tells us that um, he was sent down to Enniscorthy to deal with Wilson. Um, he didn't have a lot of sympathy uh, for Wilson and the things he had done. And himself and Liam Tobin went down in early 1920 and uh, they brought Lee Wilson's life to an end. His wife never believed um, he, was, uh, he had performed any of those acts in the Rising. Um, and she was a young woman. She returned to college, became a pediatrician, and practiced in Ireland for the next 40 years or so, and acquired the Caravaggio at an art sale in Scotland. Uh, when it was identified in the 1990s by an art expert as a lost Caravaggio, um, the Jesuits who she had presented the painting to uh, gave it to the National Collection. Um, Taunton uh, tells of how he went to Enniscorthy to deal with Lee Wilson in the company of Liam Tobin. Uh, they were given information as to where they could find him. Uh, they watched him for five days before they eventually killed him. Uh, another account says how Michael Collins bounced into um, a Wicklow Street hotel, delighted and pleased that at last uh, they had taken out Lee Wilson. So this is a photograph of Frank uh, sitting at his chair. I know it's not very clear, but it's said to have been from his intelligence headquarters. And if you, if you uh, sort of screw your eyes a bit, you'll see that he has a, a nice Webley revolver in his right hand sitting across his chest. Patrick Taunton was the youngest of the Taunton family. Uh, he had been badly wounded in Fairview during the Rising. He was only 15 years old at the time. So when he was rounded up as part of that general arrest in the aftermath of the Rising, when they realized he was only 15, they let him go. Uh, as a result of the wounds he received at Fairview, he suffered from hemorrhaging and spent the next three or four years in different sanitaria until he came back to Drogheda in 1919, where Joe Stanley, uh, the Republican printer, as he's described, had opened a series of cinemas along the border. Uh, it was, I should say, the border of uh, um, Leinster and Ulster. There was no border there at the time. But he opened a cinema in Drogheda. He opened a cinema in Dundalk, Monaghan and Cavan. And he gave Patrick Taunton a job in the cinema as like a front office uh, desk clerk. Um, he was 18 years at the time. And uh, one night, uh, the Black and Tans raided the cinema. And Patrick Taunton uh, was taken from the cinema by the Black and Tans on the 4th of February, 1921. He was given quite a beating and he was dumped in the nearby Bolton Square. Uh, on the bottom of this picture, uh, somebody, the artist, I assume, has written that he was killed by Black and Tans in Drogheda in 1921. Remarkably, there's no report in the papers of his murder. Indeed, there's no report of the event. Um, in the claim files I later read, it said that he was left in and found in Bolton Street, was taken home, and about four or five hours later, he died. Uh, from his wounds and the beating that he had received. So perhaps then it wasn't uh, considered to be a murder at the time, uh, though Frank Taunton felt very much that it was. Um, the local nationalists decided that this was an opportunity uh, to have a real show of strength, and they gave volunteer Patrick Taunton a very impressive uh, funeral. He was removed to St. Peter's West Street on Sunday evening, 
And on Monday morning, flanked by volunteers and coming among, the funeral took place to St. Peter's Cemetery, uh, followed by lorry loads of military and police. The Drogheda de Argus noted that Jack Halpin, a brother of the alderman, was arrested for having his hands in his pockets outside the graveyard. The next day being Tuesday, it was noted in the media that gangs of armed men were patrolling the town. Tom Halpin arrived home at 10 a.m. Um, having been um, at the pictures with his brother-in-laws, Hugh and Michael Leach. Now this section in relation to the murders of Thomas Halpin and Sean Moran, I've compiled from all the different sources and the different reports that were there to try and give a, a blow by blow, minute by minute account of what happened to them. So, he, Tom Halpin went to bed about 10.30 on Shrove Tuesday, and shortly after midnight, the front door was blasted off. Six armed men in great coats carrying revolvers came into the house. Three of them, holding candles, rushed upstairs where Halpin was asleep. They asked Tom his name and arrested him, and about 10 men remained outside on the street. They did not give him time to get fully dressed, and before he was led away, he assured his wife that everything would be okay. They marched him away down Georgia Street and through the horse fair. Tom's hat and muffler were found there the next morning. As they passed Westgate RIC barracks, where there was normally a police sentry on duty, there was no sentry present. Locals said they heard Tom call out as he passed the barracks. Uh, they crossed the main street and paused at the town clock, or the tonsil as it's known, at the corner of West Street. At the home of Sean Moore in, in Magdalen Street, similar happenings were taking place. Armed men forced their way into the house. They asked Moore in his name and if he was a son of William Moore and of Enniscorty. Mrs. Moran heard one of the men remark, this is the chap who shot D.I. Wilson. She said they spoke with foreign accents and told her, you may see him or not again. They marched Moran across Magdalen Street and down Peter Street, linking with the group who had arrested Halpin. Both men were forced down Shop Street, across St. Mary's Bridge and down South Quay. They passed the South Quay RIC barracks, one of two in the town, but again, there was no police sentry outside, which was the normal practice. The group continued down the Marsh Road and under the railway viaduct, the main link between Dublin and Belfast, uh, there was always a permanent military sentry because of events in the country at the time. But again, there was no sentry on duty, and no one could explain why. Just below the viaduct on waste ground, the two men were faced towards the River Boyne and repeatedly shot in the back until dead. Locals reported hearing shots about 2 a.m. Um, at 7.30 a.m., a man named James McAvoy from Mornington, on his way to walk in Drogheda, came upon the terrifying scene. He immediately reported to Sergeant Freel at South Quay Barracks. Now the papers say that the man's name was O'Brien. They also say his name was Downey. But in the official record, it's James McAvoy who the police were caught. As news spread into the town, townspeople arrived at the scene. The mayor, Philip Monaghan, Alderman Morphy, and Mr. John Halpin, Tom's father who fell to his knees and offered a prayer out loud for the repose of his dead son. At 8 a.m., Mrs. Halpin sent Tom's breakfast down to Westgate Barracks. It was only then she heard the news. The breakfast was returned. The bodies were removed at half past nine to Millmount Military Barracks. A military inquiry was held at Millmount Barracks on Thursday morning, from which the public were excluded. The findings of the inquiry were shot by persons unknown. The bodies of Halpin and Moran were released by the military on Thursday afternoon 
and brought the St. Peter's Church in West Street at 5 p.m. Both coffins were draped in tricolours and along the route, hundreds knelt and recited the rosary. The coffins were placed side by side at the high altar in St. Peter's with members of the Irish volunteers providing the guard of honour. Following 10 a.m. mass on Friday morning, Moran's coffin was brought to Drogheda railway station and home to Enniscorthy by way of Dublin. Thousands of townspeople followed the hearse and then returned to St. Peter's at 2 p.m. for Halpin's burial. This is a photograph of Halpin's coffin being carried uh, from the church. All business in the town was suspended and while the military and lorries followed the cortege, there were no incidents. The mayor, Philip Monaghan, enraged by what he saw happening, uh, called a special meeting of the corporation uh, as soon as he had heard of the deaths. At the meeting, he said that since his arrival in the town, Monaghan, there was no more active member of his organization than Tom. I assume he's referring to the Irish volunteers because he was also the, brig the, brig the brigade commandant in the town. He remembered a time when the membership was only 10 and that Tom Halpin was one of them. The following week, Monaghan, writing to the local paper, said the military inquiry was a sham. Nobody was made aware of it. It was held behind closed doors. Witnesses were not called. Did the police not hear anything? Perusing the files at Kew Gardens shows that the authorities were determined not to allow a public inquiry at any cost. On the 10th of May 1921, the Adjutant General ordered that no further action would be taken on this matter, as too much propaganda would be achieved by the mayor. So he didn't really give a damn about what happened uh, to Halpin and Moran. He was more concerned about the mayor and what he might achieve in the media. A file in Kew Gardens further outlines that following the events, a Lieutenant H.R. Chandler said he visited both widows, requesting their attendance at the Court of Inquiry at Millmount. He was advised Mrs. Halpin was too ill to attend. Mrs. Moran said she would not give it evidence unless the inquiry was an open court. Although members of the families agreed to identify the, body, uh, the bodies, witnesses in, in attendance at the inquiry were Dr. Hamill of Lawrence Street, who carried out the autopsy, Jack Halpin, uh, a brother of Tom's, identified his body, and William Moran, a brother of Sean Moran, who just coincidentally was walking in Navan at the time, uh, he identified Sean's body. Sergeant Freel, of the RIC confirmed um, that he did not inform the mayor as it was not his duty. All families refused to give evidence unless it was an open court. The inquiry findings came that they had died from gunshot wounds fired by persons unknown who are guilty of willful murder. Frank Taunton, uh, writing in a statement to the Bureau of Mil Military Intelligence, stated in relation to the events in Drogheda on February 9th, 1921. Thomas Halpin and Sean Moore in IRA were taken from their homes and shot dead. This was the night of Paddy Taunton's funeral, which had been broken up by Igo's gang earlier in the day. Tom Halpin was OC Drogheda, and his sister states that before he was taken away, he was interrogated as to the whereabouts of Frank, Frank and Hugh Taunton. John Moran, it is believed, was shot because he was suspected of having been at the shooting of Lee Wilson and Gorey earlier on. Moran had nothing to do with this particular job. The shooting of Captain Lee Wilson was carried out by GHQ staff from Dublin. Eugene Igo was a Mayo man who had set up a special unit within the RIC uh, where his men, he, where he would bring police constables from different parts of the country up to Dublin, uh, dress them up in mufti and let them wander the streets to see if any IRA activists from their native area were also wandering the streets and effectively finger them, finger them because 
as you probably know, uh, Collins believed that whoever would win the war in Dublin would win the war. And so he asked for support from various volunteer groups by bringing men into Dublin. Igo was charged with putting an end to Collins and his cronies, as they described them. And uh, so he came to Drogheda looking for Frank Totten, who they knew uh, was one of Collins' right-hand men. Um, their information was very good because not many people in Drogheda would have been so aware of Frank Totten. And Tom Halpin would have been one of the few people who could have identified them as they had attended school together. Um, the finger, as far as Taunton was concerned, was at Igo and his gang for the murders. Um, the foresters of Drogheda uh, marched en masse at Halpin's funeral. You can see them here with their proud banner, uh, which would be later displayed at the unveiling of Halpin's monument. On Thursday, the 17th of February, 1921, one week after the events in Drogheda, the postmaster in nearby Navan, Thomas Hodgett, was murdered in strange circumstances. While a culprit was never identified, the evidence points to a district inspector, Meredith Egan, and the Gormanston Black and Tans. Meredith Egan had taken over control of the RIC in Drogheda on the retirement of D.I. Carberry in 1921. And in a document compiled from Michael Collins during the truce, it was pointed out on the day of the murders in Drada, District Inspector Egan and Sergeant Friel, who we mentioned already, had been searching the town for Halpin. So it's amazing that the same uh, culprit should turn up in two, as a suspect in two brutal murders a week apart in towns that are about 20 miles apart. Joseph O'Higgins, writing in the Bureau of Military History, uh, and this is why it makes me uh, cautious as to what the depositions say, O'Higgins, a Dundalk man, said that the shooting of Halpin created a sensation in Drogheda, particularly as it was known that Halpin was not a volunteer. Now, I don't know what motivated that statement, but... Um, makes me think that there's a need to uh, be nervous or be cautious, I suppose, when you read statements in the military bureau, you can't take them as gospel. Compensation. Well, no Irish pensions were paid uh, to either family because according to the newspapers, compensation to Bridget Moran, uh, his widow, William Moran, his father, and Maura Moran, his daughter, under the Criminal Inquiries Ireland Act of 1919 was paid by the council and compensation was al also paid to Agnes Halpin and his Tom's baby son, Oliver. However, I can find no proof of any compensation being paid. And I have read many papers on compensation claims in Drogheda, but there's no mention of any payment to the families. And as I say, if you search the uh, pensions. There are some claims put in by the Moran family, but it's pointed out that the compensation uh, was already granted to them. Uh, shortly after the events of that terrible Shrove Tuesday, Ash Wednesday, Tom Halpin's widow wrote to the Drogheda Corporation and said that Tom, that she believed Tom died for the sole reason of loving his faith and fatherland. On the fourth anniversary of Halpin's death, the Drogheda Independent noted, 12 months has passed since Tom Halpin was taken from his home in the dead of night and shot to death. Those of us who knew him are convinced he met his untimely death because he loved dark Rosaline. We know that he died as he would have liked to die, pouring out his heart's blood for his own native land. Would that he had lived to see the town, the dawn of freedom, break over Slevenamon, yet perhaps he watches.
still. So there obviously were sympathizers in the uh, Drogheda Independent who had high regard uh, for Tom Halpin. The monument was unveiled, by was supported and funded by public subscription. And it was unveiled in Drogheda in 1929 in memory of Alderman Tom Halpin, a native of Drogheda, and Sean Moran of Enniscorthy, who were brutally murdered on this site by persons unknown. And the town again turned out en masse. Uh, Mr. Halpin addressed the crowd, and he said that he remembered coming to the site eight years before to find his dead son. It was the saddest day of his life, but this day was a very happy one, as the townspeople had turned out to remember these young men who had given their lives for their native land. I always feel that perhaps they died innocent. Uh, while they were uh, activists, Halpin being a Sinn Féin alderman and Moran being a captain in the volunteers, the information that Igor Gang sought was on Frank Taunton, and neither men could possibly have known where Taunton was. But the persons unknown were members of the Black and Tans RIC, uh, and they were the murderers. There's certainly no doubt in my mind. Thank you very much for listening. Sean, that was just incredible. That was really, really good. You can see in the comments, uh, we'll read out some of the comments and some of the questions as well. Such a moving story. Um, first of all, um, everyone's congratulating you about your singing earlier. Uh, Liam, was <laughs> just sent to uh, uh, Sean. Can you share all six verses afterwards, or maybe we can do that with the YouTube video. We can stick the verses underneath, maybe. Uh, Patricia, nice rendition, Sean. Liam Sullivan, brilliant singing, Sean. Cormac McDonald, great singing. Joe Cregan, thank you for your time doing this presentation. Sean Moran is my husband. Uh, Michael Fitzpatrick's granduncle and Sean's nephew, Des Fitzpatrick, will be thrilled with this presentation. Such a proud heritage we have. Uh, Liam O'Sullivan um, <laughs> is saying, just as well, I didn't know Michael's family history when we worked together. Uh, Joe Cregan also says, I, I smile when people think my husband is English with his London accent. If only they knew his grandparents, John Fitzpatrick, Granny Mai, Moran Fitzpatrick, a granduncle, Sean Moran were so active. Sean's nephew, Des Fitzpatrick, is 83 now and loves recounting the stories of his uncle and proud to be related. Um, I have a question for you. What was the media reaction like after the killings, considering so many came out to honour him or honour them into town? Because you can see it with the photos. How did the press cover it? Uh, the the uh, Drogheda Independent and the Drogheda Argus were very, very sympathetic. Uh, the Freeman's Journal were the first to report it. Uh, they reported it. It happened on the 9th of February. The Freeman's Journal carried the story on the 10th. Uh, all the papers were very sympathetic. Halpin was extremely popular in Drogheda, uh, as his election showed. Mm. Um, he had participated so much in, I suppose, all sorts of public events. He performed at local concerts. He was a football star. He was a Holland star. Uh, Moran had come to live in the town uh, only recently, and there was great regret that he was murdered, particularly as he had begun to make Drogheda's home, but never really got the chance. So the papers were very sympathetic. The mayor, Monaghan, was very vociferous in the whole notion of what had happened, and he didn't hide behind the door. They said Halpin uh, was also very much an, out an outspoken nationalist. And he had attended uh, his corporation meetings right up to the time of his death, when at that time, with the uh, harassment of Republicans and nationalists in town uh, by the RIC, uh, one councillor remarked that he was afraid to attend council meetings, but Halpin never missed. Okay, okay. Uh, Noel McGlynn, great detailed talk, Sean, many thanks. Bernie Gibbons, thanks for such interesting information. Sorry, she couldn't stay to the end. Um, another question, can you explain more about the person suspected of two killings 20 miles apart? Well, I only discovered the document in Michael Collins's papers at UCD, mm. uh, but they compiled a document during the truce in June 21, uh, where they uh, set out a series of questions 
about what was happening in the town, the strength of the RIC, the strength of the military, British sympathisers are all listed. The Loud County Golf Club comes in for some very poor comments, I might add. <laughs> <laughs> but in the general comments in the document, it was pointed out that District Inspector Egan had been looking for Tom Halpin all day on Tuesday. Okay. Uh, Egan, when he came to town uh, in, in November of 1920, immediately set about making it uh, um, a hard place for rebels to survive. The first two houses he raided were those of uh, Larry Walsh, a 1916 man, and Tom Munster, another 1916 man. Um, and Walsh, who had a small business, his niece told me that, uh, and this was back in, I think about 1970, uh, she told me that she remembered being brought as a child to her uncle's shop, which had been wrecked by the Black and Tans. His car had been confiscated and he had disappeared. Uh, he was gone on the run, uh, but her mother and her father took over the running of the shop in her uncle's absence. Remarkably, in Kew Gardens, I found a report from um, Meredith Egan, uh, which began with the line, Larry Walsh has gone on the run. We confiscated his car. <laughs> Walsh escaped to Liverpool. I don't know if it was through Taunton's connections or whatever, but that's where he went. Um, but Egan immediately set about raiding any homes of well-known nationalists. And as I say, it started in December of 1920, by February of 1921, barely two months after many events, um, Halpin is murdered. Recently, I attended a lecture in Navan uh, on the murder of uh, Hoggett, uh, who was the postmaster, and spoke to the researcher, and he told me how, well, they couldn't pin the murder on anybody. The one person that turned up as being guilty was this Meredith Egan who was the district inspector with the garments town, Black and Tans, who were in Navan on the night. Uh, Egan was a native of Oldcastle and himself and his brother and possibly his father were all members of the RIC. Okay. After that, I can't get a picture of him anywhere. That's something I was trying to find. No problem. Um, what else was I going to say? Um, great detailed talk, Sean. Thanks very much. Um, Let's see, we've also got, um, just reading them out here, we've got so many comments actually coming through here. Um, great talk and also through from Patrick. However, just like so many cases in Derry and Belfast in later years, it seems very familiar. Thank you, Sean, great talk, so sad and true. That was a great talk tonight, well done, very interesting from Cormac McDonnell. And Michael O'Dowd, fantastic lecture, Sean. Um, Seamus Duffy, what regiment from the British Army was the persons from who it is alleged carried out the murders of these two men. Didn't you mention Gormanstown camp? Because Collins has singled out Gormanstown camp before as very vicious. No, no, my, my, point, my point is this. The, that was the reason I read out the, uh, the memorial, uh, the, the, um, the detail from the different uh, memorials that exist. The monument in Drogheda says members of the British Army. Uh, Halpin's headstone says members of the British Army. Uh, I don't believe the British Army were involved. Um, I, 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 I don't uh, uh, point the finger at them at all. <clears throat> I would put it down to Black and Tan RIC. Uh, that's who carried out the murders. But the nationalists are, are the people that erected the monuments put that on the monument. But oh. I, I think they got it wrong. Okay. Um, uh, just for anybody's information, the regiment in Drogheda at the time with the King's Own Yorkshire Light Infantry. They departed Drogheda on the December 6th, 1921, just after the treaty was signed. Okay. Uh, Liam O'Sullivan uh, has said, Joe McMahon from Kilmally and Clare was one of the team involved in the Lee Wilson assassination. Apparently he whistled to get Lee Wilson to turn around. He was blown up in Cavan in 1921, he spent a lot of time in Kilkenny before moving to Wexford. He took part in the Hugginstown ambush in Kilkenny. Any insight into Joe's involvement in Wexford? Or? No, it's not something I'm familiar with, but just, just on that episode in the killing of Lee Wilson, 
Uh, Taunton seemed very determined that uh, um, Moran had no part in it. Yeah. Um, I spoke to um, a well-known Wexford historian, and he was of the same mind that Moran had no part. The only reference, if you like, to Moran's involvement in Enniscotti, apart from the photograph from Raffles' funeral, and we know about 1916 and all that, um, an, officer, uh, an IRA officer named Patrick Murray uh, writing in support of a compensation claim by Moran's sister, uh, said that he knew Moran was on the run from Wexford. But I haven't been able to find anything else to confirm or deny that. Um, is there any common misconceptions regarding how this story is told about the killings? I mean, maybe you could. Well, well in Drogheda, when I was growing up, uh, you were told that uh, they were two IRA men and in a gun battle with the Black and Tans, they were killed. Okay. Uh, and it was as simple as that. It was part of the war. And uh, then when, you, when I started delving into it, uh, I began to find that there was a lot more to it than that. And um, when I first looked at this, uh, or the, when I first looked at the newspaper account about 40 years ago, uh, I read the whole account. And uh, in college, I remember Michael Laffin, uh, who's an expert on this period, Oh, yeah. explaining the need uh, when reading the document to read it and read it and read it again. I found myself going back to the original newspaper account 30 years later and here in a small column one and a half inches by two inches was the report of Patrick Taunton's funeral which was the key to the whole event but when I looked at it for the first time 35 years ago, I didn't know about Taunton or wouldn't have even identified it. Um, so that's the importance of really studying your source. Absolutely. Uh, Sandra Kay, so, so interesting, Sean. Many thanks. Um, just in the stop them growing at the soldiers, very British. Uh, Jenny, thank you, Sean. Very interesting. Seamus Duffy, thank you for sharing uh, from Seamus Duffy and Derry. Uh, Martin Smith, thank you, my friend. Great talk. Uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, Patrick Kilfeather, thank you for an incredibly detailed presentation. We must never forget those brave men and women who gave us our freedom. Patricia, great lecture. Sean, can you do some more for us as you have a wealth of local knowledge? I'd 100% back you up, Patricia. I think you should. Nigel Rafferty, if he had so many bad memories, did they bury Sergeant Carberry and draw it out of spice? <laughs> no, sorry, let's give him his full title. He was district inspector. <laughs> I, I think the reason, the, the real reason he was buried in Drogheda was he had a son who died around about 1980 and, and the family plot was then established in Drogheda. So Carberry came back there to be buried and his wife, who was a native of the town, was also buried there. So I assume that's why Carberry was there. Um, I'm always amused, um, many, many years ago, um, I was speaking to some tourists and one of them was from Germany and he's, when he heard I was from Drada, he asked me, did I ever hear of red settlers called Boyne? And I said I did and I said they were owned by the District Inspector of Police, Dr. or D.I. Carberry and he pointed out to me that he had won uh, one of his red settlers in Germany, the paper showed that 60 years before it had descended from Boyne. Oh. So it must have been a very fine strain of dogs that Cavalry kept. Absolutely. Uh, very interesting presentation, Sean. Uh, from Catherine, thank you, very interesting. Colin Byrne, I didn't know whether that was Sean Collins or Phil Collins singing. <laughs> 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 but seriously, <laughs> Jacinta, uh, thanks, Sean. Great presentation. Kathleen Cleary, Sean, thanks for a great presentation. Um, Falcha, Joe's husband. Um, let's see, Paul O'Brien, Sean, thank you. Really enjoyed that. Uh, Guramai got Sean, excellent. Um, just uh, something uh, about Michael Fitzpatrick, who's joined the meeting with his wife. Um, I'd just like to say that we do hope that you have enjoyed um, this talk tonight. It certainly is one of those areas that doesn't get looked at enough and it's such a sad story. Um, Mary McGee has also said such a sad story. Uh, I hope we are now a nation worthy of their sacrifice. Very well presented, well done. Nearly there. Jacinta, Sean, as you know, I grew up in Dungannon. 
The B specials were British and therefore linked with the army because they were facilitated by them. They were ruthless. I think the link with black and tans to the army is similar. Um, thanks, Sean. Nigel Rafferty, great stuff, Sean. Miriam Mayer, thanks, Sean. Fascinating lecture tonight. So many familiar stories from all over the country. And ONF, thank you. Good talk tonight. Um, Sean, I'd like to particularly thank you. I think you're a jewel in terms of telling history around Louth. Uh, you do not pay me to say that either. I genuinely think so. Um, I think with a full credit to you in terms of the information you dug up tonight. Uh, thank you so much. Is there anything that you'd like to say at the end? No, uh, thank you for all the kind comments. Uh, it's nice to hear that. It's nice to hear that so many people are interested. And just to congratulate you, Marcus and Liam O'Sullivan, for the great work you're doing, particularly in time of COVID. I found the lectures a, a great lifeline, and I'm delighted to have the opportunity to have participated. Thanks, Sean. A pleasure and an honour. Thank you, everybody. Remember, next Wednesday, we're looking at the Spanish flu. Okay. Okay. Take care. Bye.